So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you um, a little bit of information on the congressional hearing. So in this lecture today, what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the stage. I'm going to deliver the same speech to you that I delivered to Congress. I'm going to then call for questions for our panelists, our representatives, members of Congress. And also, if I'm able to, I'm going to show you a little bit about behind the scenes. So what brought me to testify before Congress was my membership in an international panel on biodiversity and ecosystem services by the United Nations. This is the parallel panel to the IPCC, International Panel on Climate Change, which you are probably more familiar with. But the IPBES in 2019 released a report that showed that one million species were at imminent risk for extinction within 10 years. If you do the arithmetic, that is approximately 200 species per day. But remember now, when we released this report in 2019, that was before the extraordinary wildfires in Australia, before the tropical rainforest burned in, in Brazil, Venezuela, and in Ecuador, and before the extraordinary bleaching that occurred last summer in the Florida Keys. And so our feeling right now is that instead of 1 million species per day, it's more like 400 species per day. And that's beginning to approach the Permo-Triassic boundary extinction of the dinosaurs. We are in the sixth extinction. The loss of biodiversity across this planet is extremely important. Now, as a result of that, uh, Chairwoman uh, Edie Johnson from Texas in, convened a hearing with the um, Space and Technology Committee and invited me to testify before Congress. She also did something very unusual. She said, Dr. Porter, will you bring with you Chasing Coral so that we can have the Capitol Hill premiere of your film? And I said, yes, that would be wonderful to do. And she suggested, let's have it at 11 o'clock in the morning, right after the hearing. And I said, thank you for the invitation, but I have a different idea. Let's show that at 4.30 in the afternoon instead. She said, why should we do that? And I said, that way, members of Congress, both Senate and House of Representatives, could bring their children to see it as well. She said, that's a great idea, and that's what we'll do. We'll have it that afternoon. So, Madam Chairwoman, members of Congress, thank you for inviting me today to talk about an incredibly important biodiversity question of the loss of biodiversity worldwide. What I will do in my testimony today is three things. First, I will describe the crisis. Second, I will state why it matters to you here in Washington, D.C., although I will be talking about something that occurs in the tropics all over the world. And finally, I'm going to be pinpointing the causes for this loss of biodiversity. And because you have specifically asked me, I am going to discuss with you some of the solutions to this problem. And I will do all of these things today in my testimony to you. Now, the coral reefs are extremely unusual. They cover only 1% of the Earth's planet. And yet, within them are 30 to 50 percent of all marine species. This is a film from Chasing Coral. Coral reefs generate 10 trillion dollars a year, 60 billion dollars in the U.S. alone, in Florida and Hawaii. They are the sole source of protein and income for half a billion people across this planet, most in countries that have no other source of protein and no other source of income. And the biodiversity in Pulse has produced new drugs from the sea, one of them being a drug that can replace AZT and another that prevents heart attack in elderly Americans. Now, in this hearing, you have heard that overfishing, plastic pollution, and invasive species are important driving the loss of biodiversity. But I'm here on Capitol Hill today 
to tell you that climate change is the most important factor that is influencing the loss of biodiversity and especially in the world's oceans. The reason that this is true comes from two ironies, which you must understand to understand the role of climate change in this biodiversity loss. The first is the army that although corals are animals, they are dependent entirely on photosynthesis. 15% of the weight of coral is not uh, animal, like the sea anemones that they are taxonomic related to, but the living algae inside them. They have a salad bar inside of them. And that has a profound influence over everything. The alga that grows inside of them has the beautiful name Symbiodinium, and it affects everything about their biology and ecology. For instance, the presence of this alga means that when we describe a coral, the taxonomic terms that we use are the blades, the branches, the understory, the upper story. Those are plant terms, not animal terms. But because of the presence of the algae, the three-dimensional structure of this animal is that of a plant. And the gorgeous colors of the coral reef are conferred not by animal pigments, but by plant pigments. The green that you see here for this animal is the presence of chlorophyll. And those two things in combination give this extraordinary look and feel to a coral reef. Now, the second irony is that corals, although they are animals, we're going to go to the next slide. Corals are tropical, so you'd think they would love warm water. They're tropical organisms. But the irony is that corals are much closer to the higher lethal temperature that kills them than to the lower lethal temperature. You can cool the coral right down a little bit, but you cannot heat it up. So on the left, you see under normal temperatures that you have here, you see the uh, We've disconnected the changer here. Let me try this. All right. We have normal temperatures. Is, is that going to be connected to this? And here we have only the addition of 1.5 degrees centigrade. And the reason that this additional temperature will kill a coral and a coral reef is that the high temperature kills the coral algae. We cook the spinach that's inside of them, that is powering them. And this is so important to the life of coral reef. And when that algae dies, what happens is that we have a phenomenon for a term which I coined called coral bleaching. The algae die, the animal doesn't die immediately, and you see through the clear flash of the animal to the white limestone skeleton underneath, and from chasing coral, here is how we describe that to the general. Coral bleaching itself is a stress response, much like a fever in humans is a stress response. With when we get a bacteria, we try to get rid of it as quickly as possible. That's exactly what these animals do. They try to get rid of those plants that are no longer functional and leave behind the transparent naked tissue. They've lost the very most important food source that they have. So it's starting to starve. When the coral bleaches, the flesh becomes clear. And what you're seeing is its skeleton underneath. So the bright white that you see in the pictures is just the skeletons everywhere. We project that by the end of this century, the temperature is going to rise. And it is going to rise above that 1.5 degree threshold that I just described to you. Now, before 1985, coral reefs had the beautiful colors that they normally have. But starting in 1985, the temperature of the world's oceans began to excursion, have excursions above that threshold. And when that happened, these coral reefs turn white. And during the first year of bleaching, the corals will lose their algae. They lose their energy reserves because the algae are gone. 
but they, and they cannot reproduce, but they can survive. However, the fear is that by 2040, which is not that far off, we're going to have back-to-back -back bleaching years. And that is what could kill a coral reef because without the energy reserves provided by the algae in the second year, coral reefs die. That's where the 1.5 degree centigrade that you have heard so much about comes from. It comes from the study of coral, it comes from my laboratory. And that is a message that I am bringing with you today. We have a target that we would like to stay below. So why is the temperature rising? Now I'm aware that within the panel that is in front of me, there is a perception that climate change and global warming is a controversial subject. However, it is very easy to explain, and I would like to start by explaining it with my favorite photograph that I took on Mount Loa Observatory in the Hawaiian Islands. I like this photograph because it is the only place on the planet where you can, at the same time, see both snow and coral reefs. There's the snow, and there are the coral reefs. This is unique, but it's also an important point in Mount Loa because over the last 50 years, the amount of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere has been measured systematically, and it produces what is known as the Keeling Curve. In my view, this discovery from environmental science is as important as the discovery of DNA in the last century. These are the two graphs and the two discoveries that define our understanding of modern biology and of the way in which the world is going to change. Now, some of you would say our blame for fossil fuels is misguided. For instance, let's start thinking about what's going on here. This upward curve of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere requires the addition of 38 billion metric tons of CO2 every year to the atmosphere. That's what you have to do. You cannot get this curve without adding that. However, this is the same amount that we add to the atmosphere every year by burning coal, oil, and natural gas. There is no disconnect between the observations that we make here and the way in which the world is changing. So you might say, well, this makes no sense. Coal is a solid, and you're talking about a gas. Yes, but coal is in the ground. We bring it out of the ground and we burn it. Oil, it's true, it's a liquid. It's not a gas. But it was in the ground, and we took it out, and we burned it. And natural gas, yes, it was a gas, but we took it out of the ground, and we burned it in the atmosphere. And when you do that, the burning of fossil fuels explains the entirety of this graph. I think a lot of people don't realize that climate change is happening because most of the extra heat trapped by greenhouse gases has been transferred to the oceans. When you burn fossil fuel, that's burning oil, gas or coal, carbon dioxide goes up into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide has the property that it's able to trap heat. So the more you have in the atmosphere, the greater the amount of heat trapped by the earth. It's a bit like putting extra wool into your sweater. What people don't know is that 93% of the heat that's trapped is going into the ocean. That's a lot of energy. If the oceans weren't doing this job of absorbing the heat, the average surface temperature of the planet would be 122 Fahrenheit. Now, how do we know something like that? Why would we make a statement like that? Because we have measured it. What you see here are observations on the temperature of the world's oceans from 1880 to 2017. And what I'm going to do is show you an animation from NASA. And when this area of the ocean is blue, it means that the water temperature is less than that 150 year average. And when it is red, it is higher than that 150 year uh, temperature average. 
here we go. In 1880, it was cooler and it became warmer and warmer and warmer. The oceans are hotter now than they have ever been since we began measuring them. Now, the way in which we measure the heat that has been added to the Earth's atmosphere by burning fossil fuels is in a unit of heat called a zeta joule. You in Congress may be forgiven for not knowing what a zeta joule is. A zeta joule is the detonation of 10,000 one megaton thermonuclear bombs. That's what a zeta joule is. And what that means is that in the last half century, we have essentially detonated in the Earth's atmosphere a million bombs per year. And over the last 50 years, we have detonated on our planet 50 million bombs. That's what we have done. That's where the heat that we're talking about was generated. But the irony is that the atmosphere has only absorbed 7% of that global warming heat. The world's oceans, on the other hand, have generated, have absorbed 93% of that heat. And that's why the oceans are heating up, and that's why we have been able to measure it. Yes, sometimes there are cold winters, warm winters, but in the ocean, it is always, every year, warmer and warmer and warmer. If the heat generated by greenhouse gas driven global warming had not gone into the ocean, the average temperature outside this room right now would be 122 degrees Fahrenheit. This is physics. This is not politics. I understand, members of Congress, that I am standing in a political arena. But I am here to tell you that someone cannot have their own science. They must have the facts. They must make their policies based upon the facts. And the fact is that the oceans have acted as the Earth's punching bag to absorb the heat generated by the burning of fossil fuel, and that we cannot continue that because it affects the biodiversity of our planet so much. Now, there's another reason that we know that this has happened, and it relates to reef building corals. Something that people don't really realize is that corals, like trees, lay down annual growth rings. And you can see them here, and I'm going to show them in these, this demonstration that I will pass around. This is a cross section x ray of this coral skeleton from our museum that you see here, and I would like you to look at it. That is an example of this kind of increase in temperature that can be done, understood from these growth rings. Each growth ring stores with it the temperature at which it was deposited. So it isn't just ships of opportunity that have given us those temperature records for the entire ocean. It is the corals that I work on that have also given us this information. Our current warm ocean temperatures have never occurred in at least the last 500,000 years. That is the fact. You may think, well, this is just a cycle that we go through. Good morning. Coral bleaching in Hawaii is gaining a lot of attention so much. That this certainly isn't a natural cycle. This is a phenomenon directly attributed to climate change, and it's something that we've only seen in recent years. One of the ways of looking back in time with a reef is to take coral cores or slices through coral. You can look at growth rings in corals in the same way as you can look at growth rings in trees. You can see a regular normal growth pattern. This coral grows at around a centimeter and a half per year, every year, 
right up until 1998, where you start to see the signature of a coral bleaching event. By tracking back in time, by looking at the history of the reef, we're absolutely certain that what we're seeing now is not a natural fluctuation. The cause is unequivocally global climate change driven by emitting carbon into the atmosphere. Example of what climate change has done to the coral reef. Over um, quite a number of decades, we have been photographing the coral reef in Jamaica. This is a picture of that reef. And this is the montage of what that reef looked like before coral bleaching. There you see it before, and here you see it after. Now, members of Congress, you have a right, I would say, dare say, a responsibility to be skeptical of the things that you see. And people will look at these pictures and say, that doesn't look like the same place at all. I draw your attention to the bullseye call in the lower right-hand corner of this image. There it is after, and there it is before. This is not fake news. This is what is happening to our world. This is what is happening as a result of climate change. Now, this hearing has focused on biodiversity. And most of you think of biodiversity as an issue of species loss. And some of you have told me before this committee started uh, the hearing that we all know that species come and go in the geological record, and that is true. But I would ask you to reach back into your freshman or high school biology class and remember that there is a hierarchical organization of taxonomic determination. We go from the species, the genus, the family, the order, the class, the phylum, and to the kingdom. Here's the extraordinary thing about the biodiversity of coral reefs. 85% of the time that all higher taxa in either the phylum, the class, or the order, or families first appeared on this planet, they did so first on coral reefs. This means that coral reefs are evolution's cradle where new life forms evolve radically, new life forms. And it's the museum where they are retained. And I'm going to give you an example, and we'll pass this specimen around too. Maybe a little harder to see, and so I just go ahead and peer closely. It's the class Sclerospongia, which is a class of sponges, and it has a unique property that its genetics allow it to decide whether to lay down its skeleton made out of glass, silicone, or limestone calcium carbonate. Today, glass, tomorrow, calcium, what an extraordinary adaptation. And here's the extraordinary thing. The last time that a class went extinct on planet Earth was 500 million years ago. Yes, species do come and go. Your general knowledge is correct about species. But at the higher taxonomic level of biodiversity, there is a conservatism where things are retained. But because sclerospongia are predominantly shallow water, tropical marine, we could eliminate this entire class of organisms in less than 50 years. An increase of an order of magnitude in which life forms are being erased. We're not just killing species diversity when we kill a coral reef, we are killing life's ability to generate new life. That is what is happening to the biodiversity on coral reefs. You have asked me, tell us how to address these problems that I am describing. And I understand that the Congress before me has withdrawn from the Paris Climate Accord. But I am standing here today to tell you that we should rejoin the Paris Climate Accord and for very, very good reasons. It was an extraordinary treat. First, it said we should reduce carbon emissions. It got straight to the heart of what the problem is. The long-term goal is zero net emissions. That's what we need to do. It was unequivocal. And the long-term goal to keep the temperature increases 
below 1.5 degrees centigrade. There's that number again. That's the number that we coral scientists gave to John Kerry when he negotiated this treaty. And fourthly, yes, it does ask us to help developing nations reach this goal. Most of the, the countries, the sovereign nations on earth that have coral reefs are the developing nations and their population will be pouring into our country if we devastate their only natural resource. We have many reasons to keep all this help. Now, what happens if we rejoin the Paris Climate Accords? This is global warming here that we're worried about. We see that is at 1.5 degrees again. Our concern is that by 2040, reefs all over the world will turn white. But if we implement the Paris Climate Accords, that 2040 comes down, the temperatures come down, and we buy coral reefs 100 years within which adaptation can select for more heat tolerant organisms. It's called adaptation, it's called evolution. It is a part of the natural world, but it requires time. And signing the Paris Climate Accords will do that. Now, you might say, well, under the Paris Climate Accords, the US pledges to cut emissions by 2025 and then further by 2050. And you might say, well, that's almost impossible. And once again, I acknowledge to you, the members of Congress, to ask the tough questions, can we achieve these goals without destroying our economy? You are not a bad legislator if you ask these difficult questions. This is what you were sent to Washington to do. But you might say, well, something like this is, is almost impossible. We might want to convert 1,400 coal-fired plants to natural gas. If we could do that, we take this wedge out of our pledge and we go towards our goal of reducing our carbon emissions. Again, you might say, well, that's very difficult to do. No, it's not. That's how we got from here in 2000 down to here in 2018. We just need to continue doing what we're doing. Another thing you could do is to implement full recycling. I notice here in the Raymond building, it is full of recycling uh, bins. And if we could get this sort of thing going worldwide, look at the size of the wedge it takes out of the product. We could increase automobile efficiency and look at what that does. But the state of Georgia has made a commitment to electronic batteries and electronic vehicles and Detroit has signed on to this increase in fuel efficiency as well. And notice that none of the things that we're talking about here reduce the quality of life or the ability of your constituency to make a living. We also could build 10 more nuclear power plants. And in the state of Georgia, we have just opened a new power plant. Vogel, yes, it was over budget. And yes, it was behind schedule, but Nuclear power has the advantage that it does not produce CO2 and it does not cause global warming. It saves 30 million barrels of oil per year, that one plant. That is equivalent to taking 1.4 million cars off the road and is equivalent to preventing six BP oil spills every year. I know there are safety issues with regards to nuclear power, but it is a lifeline. We need to use the energy we have to create the future we want. And nuclear power will help. And nuclear power carries the base load and overcomes the main problem with renewals, most like wind and like solar. So all nations must join to stop global warming. This is not something that the US alone has to bear that burden. But if we do this, we can succeed. We can prevent the worst effects of climate change. And we need to begin now to do this, to save the biodiversity of the planet. We can live in uh, an environment with coral reefs. And with that, members of Congress, I thank you for this.
specific example of that. We believe that sea level rise sometime by the middle of the next century is going to eliminate several sovereign nations. One of the sovereign nations is the low islands of the Bahamas and the entirety of their population, 1.2 million people, will have to go somewhere. Other low islands like the Grand Caymans are going to uh, also, St. Croix and the Virgin Islands will be below water, Turks and Caicos again. And along the way, we will have eliminated the income for half a billion people uh, in developing nations everywhere. As I mentioned, there are 180 sovereign nations on earth, 90 of them have coral reefs, the US being one, but most of them are developing nations, those developing nations will turn to us for our solutions. And in addition, in the state of Florida and the state of Hawaii, coal reefs generate $60 billion a year and generate 90,000 full-time jobs. When we protect the environment, we protect our economy, and we protect the livelihoods of the people that are reliant upon it. Thank you for that question. Michelle. Hello, I'm representing uh, biodiversity and overall ecological structure Good. provided by coral reefs. So on that, I know you mentioned previously that an entire uh, taxa of coral are yes. at threat. At risk. Yes. Uh, how would other species um, beyond coral be affected? Would you mind sharing like a brief overview as to why coral reefs are foundational for marine biodiversity? Thank you for that question. Um, every taxa will be affected, and pretty much in the same way that I've described for corals. The biodiversity of coral reefs is on one level difficult to explain. As I mentioned, less than 1% of the Earth's surface has more than 30% of all the species are found there. One of the reasons is that in general, these have over the long time been stable, highly productive environments. And so like a tropical rainforest, that combination of stability longevity have promoted the development of life forms that have not been killed off. But coral reefs are special for one other reason as well. If you look at the way that coral reefs are scattered so exotically across the face of the planet, this of course results in marvelous vacations to exotic places, but those islands all over the world are what I would call from an evolutionary point of view species generating topography. They provide the isolation as well as the stability that when colonizations occur, new life forms can evolve with a genetic discontinuity between these isolates. It's also the reason why the Pacific is so much more diverse than the Caribbean, because the Caribbean is a smaller body of water. The islands are connected by streams 
of water. But this species generating topography combined with the extraordinary stability and the glorious conditions that are created in the tropical zone applies to every group of animals, whether it's the vertebrates, the fishes, or the lower invertebrates, the sponges. And so what I have described for corals applies to everything. Thank you. Sardina. Thank you. Um, so I know you've been focusing on the climate change and how that is the most major factor in the loss of coral reefs, but I am representing a perspective on how invasive species are also affecting the biodiversity and ultimately the ecosystems and possibly what kind of measures are being taken to prevent them. Because I know that invasive species are very detrimental to ecosystems and I was wondering how that would also affect these coral reefs and their die-off and possibly what is being done to prevent thank, thank you for that question about biodiversity and the influence of invasive species. If you want to get two good buddy ecologists to start fighting with each other, you just say two words, invasive species. And one person is going to say it's climate change. Another is going to say invasive species. They are both on the spectrum of killing qualities. My focus on climate change is that we are in an accelerating situation where we are expecting the temperature not just to continue to rise in a uniform way, but to begin to go vertical as the amount of CO2 builds up and the retention of heat in the world's oceans and atmosphere continues. Invasive species are important, and I do not wish to underestimate that. But in the long run, climate change will be the central organizing principle of the 21st century. Nothing, absolutely nothing that you know or that you study will be as important to this. This will define the productivity of our agricultural areas. It will define the survivorship of the ocean. It will define the habitation of human life across the planet. 122 degrees Fahrenheit will be the average temperature of the Earth if we do not get control over this. And at that point in time, all bets are off for where life can continue. So I honor my invasive species colleagues, but I draw my attention to climate change. Hi, yes, my name is Aiden. I represent agricultural communities, and I'm primarily concerned about implementation for some of the some of what you discussed. Yes. Um, I was struck by your indication of reduced reuse recycling and how substantial yes. that that appeared to be. That program's been around for decades. How exactly would that possibly have such an increased effect? If we are really careful about the way we use materials, this can have influence at every level of the process. The new feeling about material science is not just from cradle to grave, it is now from cradle to cradle. How do we actually take it through the whole process and bring it back to reuse it? It reduces the amount of mining that we do in the world when we have to use fewer things. It reduces the amount of energy that we have to use to manufacture these things. It reduces the amount of transportation and processing. And all of those things will contribute to that. And in addition to the few variables that I showed you, there are dozens and dozens of other things that will do this as well. And the key point to be made here is that all of them in combination we need to, is what we need to do. We need to do everything all at once. We do not have the luxury to pick and choose between one thing. And, and notice that these examples and the others that I did not mention, they produce good jobs, long-term jobs, high-paying jobs. Five years ago, if I had been asked to present to Congress, I would have gone into an environment where it was jobs versus the environment. 
Now, given what we know, it is jobs because of the environment. And that will be true for material science and for the importance of recycling. And those uh, numbers that I present would be for worldwide kinds of recycling. Yes? Uh, I represent economic concern. You mentioned that there's like potential for a lot of job loss and country loss, uh, but you also stated that this issue has been happening since at least uh, 1985. Have yes. you seen any effects from this now in the present day or in the past when we see cor coral bleaching happening? We definitely have. There is absolute certainty amongst the social science community that much of the immigration that is being uh, stimulated from uh, Latin America into the United States is based on loss of jobs that relate to degrading economies and degrading environments in Central and South America. There is no question at all that climate change is going to impact and particularly impact developing nations. And this is only going to accelerate. And the United States is going to be the center for where people will want to come as they can no longer live where they are. And for the Bahama Islands, for the Turks and Caicos, uh, those kinds of islands, it will be a matter of survival that they will have to leave. And those are the kinds of influences that we have. Yes, Ryan. I, got uh, I represent um, humanities, non-scientifically yes. um, uh, specialized interests, and I wanted to ask for clarification on two points, or perhaps yes. more detail. First, um, on the history of coral and, and looking at coral rings, um, this is not something we've seen in 500 uh, million years. Right. Is there a parallel in history that can provide in, in much further history that can provide uh, insight into how to deal with this current situation. And then second, about pushing back the date for coral um, and giving them time to evolve. Is this a, a sure thing that we can rely upon um, in helping coral? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, our understanding of coral growth rates is really quite recent. And the 500 million year record that I showed you was only because we've not taken corals that are older than that and match those rings up the way they have the tree rings. You know, you get, you know, a, a, a maybe a hundred year growth rings for trees, but you start getting those logs and you go all the way back to the Vikings and suddenly you know the temperature and, and the growth rate of trees much farther than that. And coral skeletons, some of them are much older, but we haven't done that yet. We feel <coughs> that we can push that that number back farther than 500,000 years actually, and that we will do that. Um, we will do that in the very near future to stand by. Now, um, we, we know that corals have tracked the overall temperature of the planet for that period of time, going through the little ice age and melting of the glaciers. So we have great certainty that what we're finding out on the coral reef is realistic for what was happening on the planet. I also really appreciate your question about the humanities, because the issues that I've described today are, are not strictly those of science. They are of policy and how it affects people, and not just in your constituency, but all over the planet. And it is not just um, livelihoods and economy that are being destroyed, it is culture. Some of these island nations have developed cultures that, of which we are the beneficiaries of thousands of years of evolution. Our suspicion is that climate change is going to contribute to the loss of at least a hundred sovereign nation languages. So for instance, in Panama, where I did my doctoral dissertation, it's dwelling on the Atlantic coast of the Kuna Indians. They speak Kuna and that is their language. Because they are coastal people, we expect to see the extinction of Kuna language. And we expect to see uh, Guaymi and several of the other Caribbean languages disappear as well as a result of climate change. So yes, I bring my scientific expertise to this panel, but there are cultural and aesthetic reasons why we do not want to lose them. And as you saw in Chasing Coral, 
it is the beauty of nature that oftentimes we'll make that connection. And I hope that you'll come at 430 and bring your kids to see Jesse Cole. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Dr. Porter. So I represent Americans and Americans only. I don't represent the people of the island nations that you're really talking about. And my concern specifically is what do you say to all of the people who are in the coal industry, the fossil fuel industry, who are out serving in countries with oil, who are out on oil rigs, drilling for oil? What do you say to them when you take away their jobs? I say this. Do you want to have a future? Do you want your children to have a future? And I say to them, yes, I understand that you are in an extractive industry and that that extraction has given us our standard of living today. I acknowledge that is true. However, what I would say is that in a forward-looking environment and in a forward-looking economy, we need to use the energy we have, and that does include fossil fuel, to create the future that we want. I'm not saying we cannot make plastics in the future, but I'm saying we need to be very careful that we're not creating plastics that are one-time use only. Let us use those plastics that do come from fossil fuel environments. Let us use, make those plastics only in as extreme response to a need. And, and I don't think that we're going to see the loss of that many jobs if we turn to solar technology, to um, nuclear technology, to wind technology. We need to overcome those hurdles. We need to have job training that will create good jobs and in the future. And because this hearing is not being held five years ago, I can tell you that the economic numbers tell me that that idealistic point of view is realistic in terms of future economies. Go green or go broke. And that's exactly how I, I feel with that. Now, if I can, what I would like to do is to show you some of the responses. If we could have uh, this next uh, slide back up again and then see if we're connected. We will need volume. Yeah. All right. And then let's go to presentation mode. And does this work? Right. It does. Many of the people, I would say half of the committee that I spoke to, we're not playing. And what they said, the UN report is one of the junk science. You, Dr. Port, you're a junk scientist. That's okay. I've taught freshmen. <laughs> <laughs> I can get that. But look what I did in the presentation. I showed these before and after. And I brought it back that we're not talking about fake news. So let me tell you the other thing that I did, which is really something. I knew that some of the people I was speaking to were not going to be pleased with what I said. So I said, Jason Coral should be in the afternoon, and senators and congressmen brought their children to the movie. The kids wanted to see it. And they brought them, and the Rayburn House hearing room was filled. And about more, more than half the audience were students your age or younger. And so the next day when I went there, I, went, I, I talked exclusively to the staff. You know, forget, forget the big guys in, in, the, in the offices. And what they said is, oh, Dr. Porter, this really worked. Because what happened was, on the way home, the children read the riot act to their parents. And that was a way to get through to a closed mind. You are the young people who are fighting for your lives, fighting for your future. 
And your parents will listen to you. As I was telling Steve on the way in here, I'm at the University of Georgia. We did a survey and 85% of the students in my classes, my intro environmental science had up to uh, 200 students per semester. 85% of those students come from Republican households. And my favorite course review was one student wrote, Dr. Porter, I loved your class. I went home and told my parents what you had taught us. And you ruined Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was doing a good job. Thank you to the members of the, of the panel for coming out today. Um, I have really enjoyed your testimony. And although I'm a little bit fearful and frightened about our future, I also feel some optimism about our prospects. My uh, siblings and I are all scuba diver divers. I think my first checkout dive was about 28 or 29 years ago. And just in, in that period of time, what I have seen in terms of the, the degradation and the damage to the Caribbean corals is really frightening and disappointing to me because I want to be able to take my kids on scuba diving trips someday and show them the beauty of the undersea world and those reefs. And I'm not sure they're gonna be there. Dr. Porter. I want to thank you for your passion. Be passionate. I didn't pull any punches in my presentation, Congress. You shouldn't either. Stand on the science that you know. We have the same certainty about global climate change as we do about gravity. No scientist gets up in the morning to investigate whether gravity exists or not. Stand your ground. It doesn't matter whom you're speaking to. Use the training, use the knowledge that you've gained here. Go out into the world and make a difference by asking tough questions and by standing your ground on science. The facts are a good pulpit to stand on. It took a while. But here it is. The United Nations agree on language or nations agree on uh, the historic treaty and they signed it, and the United States signed it. And Edie Johnson, the chair of the committee, she paid me that honor. She said, Dr. Porter, you made a difference. And it was because of what the representative from Wisconsin had said. Dr. Porter, thank you for your passion. Share your passion for life. Never, never cover that. Don't put that candle under a basket. Don't do that. And I used to tell people, you know, vote your conscience. And then now I'm telling people, run for office. <laughs> no, you want to make a difference. That's how you do it. You stand and deliver. And you all are being trained, not just in the disciplines where you're major, your master, your PhD. You are being trained as leaders. Whether you know it or not, that's why you're here. You are very special people. You have the capability. And I know that because I've spent the last two days with you, and I know what's here. You are prepared to run for office. And I thank you for coming out.